Thank you, Pastor Brandon. Boy, it feels great to be here this morning and uh, to uh, reconnect with so many of you. Looking forward to meeting uh, just so many that we just haven't had a chance to get to know before and uh, excited to come alongside Pastor Greg and the team and, uh, and, and plug in to replug into this amazing place. I had lunch the other day sitting up on Woolastook Park overlooking the city and was just so grateful to be back in this place. Uh, we've been gone for about 10 years and uh, we're, we're just grateful to God for this amazing privilege that he's opened up for us unexpectedly, really. Um, you know, there, there's some amazing mysteries in scripture, the mystery of creation and and the mystery of the Trinity and the mystery of the incarnation, and you can just keep going down the list, but the mystery and the wonder of the body of Christ, that he dwells in us together. Corinthians says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And uh, to be able to, to just really raise up that value in our midst and encourage you to become a fully functioning part of what Christ is doing among us, is, uh, is something I'm really looking forward to. Uh, part of my history in this city goes way back when I was a kid uh, growing up in the North End and there used to be a, uh, a radio show on Sunday evening by a pastor by the name of David Crabtree and I used to listen to him. He had, a, he had an amazing influence really on my life and on my ministry. I heard him tell a story one time that uh, he, he told some amazing stories, but he talked about he and his wife driving across the desert in Arizona or somewhere. I don't know whether you've ever been there, but we get used to these small horizons here because there's so many woods around, you know, and you, you can't really see that far, but out there you're driving and like it just, it's, it's endless and it's dry and there's nothing there and the road is just going out through the middle of nowhere and they're driving across the country and uh, early in the evening, he gets weary and he pulls over and he asks his wife to, to, to drive for him. And he, he gets out of the driver's seat. And that was the days where, you know, the, the cars had the big bench seat. And she slid across the seat behind the driver's, behind the wheel. He closes the driver's door and goes back and opens the back door to crawl in, to lay down, to have a, a sleep. But then he thinks, no, I'm going to get in the other side. And he slams the door. And as he's walking around, the, you got it, as he's going around the back of the vehicle, she takes off and thinks he's in the seat and going to sleep. And I, I think the way, if I remember the story correctly, six hours later, she comes back and finds him. He's walking in the desert, freezing to death, thinking, you know, what is happening to me? And uh, almost a life-threatening situation for him. Uh, not just the sense of despair and, you know, I'm, I'm so alone, whatever fear would go along with it, but just the fatigue. And uh, she drives three hours in one direction, realizes he's not there and comes back and picks him up. And I tell that little story this morning because I want to talk to you about the state of your soul. I, I, I'm wondering today if there may be somebody within the sound of my voice that when you think about what Dave Crabtree must have been feeling walking through that desert all alone, that gives you a good mental picture of what you might be feeling spiritually and emotionally and physically in your life today. About being in a desert in your life. About feeling as though uh, everything is just shut down and closed down for you. Uh, people that are experiencing that are people who are disillusioned. And disillusioned people are people who have experienced things in their life that have compromised their ability to believe and to trust. People who are disillusioned are people who have experienced things in their life that have compromised their ability to believe and to trust. They, they've been burned, maybe. Maybe burned by their family. Maybe burned by their employer. Maybe burned by their church. Maybe burned by God or feeling as though they've been burned by God. And they've gradually paid the price for the experiences that they've had and, and these feelings. And they, they, they have ended in a place as though their, their ability to receive the good news of the gospel has just kind of gradually shut down. I recall hearing a few years ago about a little girl in Edmonton. It was quite a big Canadian news story. This little girl gets up in the middle of the night and it's in the winter and she opens the front door of her house and walks out into the snow and her mom wakes up in the morning 
can't find her, sees the door open, sees a few tracks and realizes what's happened. And she tracks her down and the little girl, of course, is pretty well frozen and lifeless. And they call the paramedics and they come and they take her to the hospital and they, they were able to, to uh, resuscitate her and in fact they revived her with no damage. And this morning I want to hopefully speak a bit of a word of hope into the life of somebody that may be here that uh, feels like they've got a frozen soul. Feel like whatever you've been walking through or going through has kind of gradually put you in a, in a desert reality in your life. And today I want to tell you that that can be a place that God can breathe new life and, uh, and revive you and bring you back to, to hope and to wholeness again. Uh, Proverbs 29, 18, you may not recognize the reference, but you've heard the verse. It says this, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I, I don't know where you are today that you wish you were not, but I do know this about you that if you're facing disillusionment of soul and spirit today, you've lost your vision. You, you, you can't look into the future. You've got nothing really to, to hang your hope upon. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the big picture of what was going on in the world in those years when people were waiting for the coming of Christ. Scripture says there had been 400 years there hadn't been a word from God. And the people were waiting. And when you're in disillusionment and you're waiting for God to show up in your life, uh, maybe it can feel like 400 years, I don't know, but it's it's a nasty place to be. It's a tough place to be. And when people are living there, when you're experiencing that, it's like it's like you're at sea in a ship and you've lost your compass. I was coming back from Grand Manan Island a couple of days ago and we left the island. It was a gorgeous day, flat, calm, and the in clear blue sky. And man, it was amazing. I was thinking, I was up on the up on the deck, sitting at the back and thinking we just picked the perfect day to cross. And we were leaving the island and you could see swallowtail light in the at the you know back behind the wake of the boat. There it was and it was just gorgeous. And I was just in the very moment of kind of trying to appreciate how beautiful that was. And it seemed like I just turned around and Swallowtail was gone. I mean, that we just kind of, all of a sudden, right in the midst of, of everything that was great, we couldn't see where we'd been, we couldn't see where we were going. And uh, that's what happens to a person sometimes in life. You get into this situation where uh, you're living under the circumstances, I guess is the good way to describe it. George Whitfield was a preacher back in the 18th century. And he, uh, he said that uh, Christians who have a hard time facing difficulty in life are sometimes people who he called, they, he said, they have an unplowed heart. An unplowed heart. He said this about them. They're happy, 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 and were never miserable because the stony ground of their heart was never plowed up. He goes on and and says how that he's a little cautious about dubbing a, a genuine convert too soon. He says, now I wait a little to see if people bring forth fruit, for there are so many blossoms which March winds blow away that I cannot believe they're converts until I see the fruit brought forth. And I I know that's probably true, you know, that that someone comes to Christ and you can, you can kind of think that they're, they've got good intentions and they're going to make a start of it. The scripture talks about fruit that, that falls on the stony ground or whatever. But I think something else he's saying there is that until a person has been deeply tested in their life, until you face some tough times, until you've actually walked through the desert in your life, you, uh, you, you, you probably haven't yet discovered the real quality of your faith. That tough times, not, not only true for Christians for sure, that tough times in a person's life bear the fruit of building character. And uh, you, the scripture puts it in the terms of being a tree that's planted by the rivers and the roots grow down deep, you know. They, they've got the ability to, to weather the drought and, and stand and stand the storm. The folks have got some Bibles if you, uh, if you need one today, and we'd love to see you have one. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, and we're going to look at two or three passages this morning. But the ninth verse of chapter 7 are, are funny words, really. If I was ever going to receive a, a letter from 
the Apostle Paul, I wouldn't want to read these words, but this is what he said. He said, now I'm happy not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended. And he goes on in verse 10 and says this, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. I, you know, what, what's, what's the difference in those two things? Well, I'm not totally sure, but he's, drawn, he's drawing the point that there's, a, that there's a good way, a right way to process what's going on in your life. And then there's a, another way, a wrong way, a worldly way, an unproductive way to process what's going on in your life. And he says he wants us to process that, the sorrow that we're experiencing in a good way. It's like, you know, someone saying, if you've never tasted the bitter in life, how are you ever going to appreciate the sweet? Maybe it's got something to do with that. But if you're in waiting today, if you're walking through a desert and saying, okay, enough already, uh, I want to tell you that God is in the midst of doing something potentially very powerful in your life. Let me say that again. If you feel like you're waiting and longing for God to show up, and you're, you're in a desert time in your life, you're in disillusionment or discouragement or disappointment, I want to tell you that God is right now in the process of doing something potentially very powerful and profound in your life. The most amazing um, glimpse into discouragement on the part of, of of a godly person, I think, is in Luke chapter 7, and it's, it, it catches Jesus at kind of the height of his ministry. He, he has just healed the centurion's servant. You remember that account? It's this miraculous healing at a distance that Jesus performs, and then he's walking along the road with his disciples, and he bumps into coming the other way. There's, there's a funeral procession, and a, a lady her son has died, and Jesus steps into the funeral procession and raises the, the kid back to life. I mean, the, the disciples are just like, this is the very best of times for them. It's happening. Jesus is popular, and they're popular. And at that juncture, John the Baptist is in prison, and he sends, he sends a message to Jesus basically saying, hey, Remember me? Have you forgot about me over here? He, he, says, he says it in, in, in this way. He says, are you really the one we thought was going to come? Or should we expect someone else? Remember John the Baptist was the one that says, there goes the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world, you know? He identified Jesus. And now he's saying, uh, maybe I mistook you. Was I wrong about you? I mean... Look what's going on in my life, and I'm wondering what you're going to do about it. Have I pinned my hopes on the wrong guy? And I love that the eyewitnesses who record the, 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 the life and times of Jesus included that glimpse into what was going on in John the Baptist's in John the Baptist's life, because it seems so real. Here's this guy who was not afraid of anybody, stood up against the mob, and just, you know, he, like he was the fearless preacher, and yet he's at this state in his life when he's even questioning the identity of Jesus himself. They say, you know, that, that you can face a lot in life if things make sense to you. I watched uh, the movie Mandela here a month or two ago on Netflix, and uh, it's, it's the story of Nelson Mandela, and you can kind of see him in, in the, you know, the, the person that he is, has been on a global scale. That's the Nelson Mandela we know, but you, you see the movie, and he's imprisoned, you know, uh, and, and he's breaking up rocks with a hammer, and you're thinking, you know, what... What, what keeps a person sane through all those years? Like, what kept him on track? Well, probably it was his sense of purpose, his, his mission. They say that, that if, if, if things kind of add up to you and you've got a reason, you've got some purpose, you, you, can, you can connect the dots, you can stand a whole lot in life. But it's when you get to a point where none of that makes sense that, that, that you kind of run out of steam. You get to the point that you think, I'm, I'm not sure I can 
go on. You know, like you've seen, the, you've seen the movies where the Navy SEALs are in training and they're on the beach and they've all got the big logs and they're, they're, they're in the cold water and they're just putting them through all this torture and, and the bell is up on the beach and all the young recruit has to do to get out of the pain that he's in, he has to walk up the beach and ring the bell and it's over for him. He can check out of there. And sometimes you may be facing some circumstances where you feel like, I'm ready to ring the bell. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to call, call it off. And, and, and I want to tell you today that, that when you're in that time of disillusionment, sometimes right when you're on the verge of a breakthrough is when, is when you're most tempted to quit. You remember, um, you remember the book that Rick Warren wrote called The Purpose Driven Life? It's probably the most famous Christian book ever written. And the, the, the immortal words in the front of that book was, it's not about you, you know. That, that understanding what the Christian life is about begins with an awareness that it's, it's really bigger than what's going on in your life. That's what Jesus, that's the word he sent back to John the Baptist. When John said, uh, are, are you the guy I thought you were? Jesus said, tell John that the lame are healed and the blind can see and that the, the word of God is going forth. He, he basically said, John... Stuff's happening, you know, the, the, the purposes of God are being accomplished in my world. And, and don't just assume because you're off on the sideline that God isn't, still, God isn't still doing his stuff. It's not about you, John. It's about what I'm doing in this place. And could I sensitively say to you today that it, at the worst of your pain, at the deepest point of your disillusionment, and, and maybe your sense of even being burned by God, that it really may not be about you, that God may be up to something even bigger than what's happening in your life. You know, it seems to me that disillusionment is at its heart the loss of an illusion. That, that perhaps what disillusionment really could be defined as is a loss of the illusion of what you thought or who you thought God actually was or is. That perhaps part of the pain we experience in the, in the desert experiences of our soul is we've had this idea of this is who God is or should be to me, and God's in the process of teaching us another view of him. The loss of an illusion. God seems to do that. And I want to ask you a couple of questions today, and the first is this. What are your, what, what current what current disillusionments do you have with God today? I'd just like you, as you're listening to me, to at least identify that. Like, what, what, what place in your life do you feel like you're in that desert experience with God? And, and the second question that follows it up is this. Is it possible for strong, dedicated, committed Christians to face disillusionment? And I think the answer to that question is yes, because the scripture is full of examples to that. I mean, take Job, the ultimate example of, of someone who faced trouble in their life. The scripture says that Job was perfect, says that he was upright, he feared God, he hated evil, and yet you know that he became the epitome of, of a good man to step through horrendous times of testing in his life. Job in uh, chapter 7 got so bummed out about what was going on, this is how he addressed God. He said, Therefore, I will not keep silent. I'll speak out in the anguish of my spirit. I'll complain in the bitterness of my soul. I despise life. Let me alone. My days have no meaning. What is mankind that you examine him every morning and test him every moment? Will you never look away from me or let me alone for an instant? If I've sinned, what have I done to you? You who sees everything we do, why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? I mean, they may seem like pretty crass words, but have you never been at the place where you thought, is God singling me out for this difficulty in my life? Like, what's up with what's going on, God? They may not sound like the words of a spiritual giant, but I want to tell you, they are. And then to make matters worse, Job had some people come around him, the, the super Christians, and at, at Job's lowest point, you know how the story goes, or you need to read the book of Job, they come along and say, well, Job, you know, you, you've got sin in your life. Or, or Job, have you never read this verse? You know, 
Or Job, you just need to declare this, or you need to believe this, or you need to say this, or you need to stop this. I mean, they had this kind of tight box of theology that they laid on Job, and it's supposed to fix all of Job's problems, and yet Job was the one that was in in agony. I remember the skit that Lindy Nice did here years ago. She's sitting at a table with a cup of coffee in her Bible, starting to have her quiet time with God, and she looks up and she says something like this. She says, God, life was a lot less complicated before I met you. And part of the problem that difficult times come in your life is you're trying to integrate, like, God, you know, what is going on here? And that's what Job was feeling. There was Others, there are others that, that fit, the, fit the mold there. Jeremiah was a prophet. He was the guy that his reputation was like he was, he was fearless. People, when he spoke, they say people shivered. And Jeremiah, he, uh, he said this in Jeremiah 20. He got so, uh, he, he was in despair so deeply, the prophet Jeremiah, he said, Cursed be the day I was born. This is Jeremiah 20. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? That's pretty low. And it doesn't sound like the words of a fearless prophet, but they are. They're the words of of a champion. And yet Jeremiah, Scripture says, got so blitzed about what was going on in his life that that he... he claimed, he said, I'm never going to mention the name of God again. That's how low he was. Elijah was kind of that same deal. Elijah was the prophet that uh, had all these amazing miracles happen. He brought a dead child back to life through the power of God. He stood before the king and said, it ain't going to rain until I tell, and I say it's going to rain, and it didn't rain. He, uh, he was an old man, and yet he, Scripture says he ran ahead of the chariots. He was the guy that was in the test with the prophets of Baal, and he was taunting them, and he built the, put the wood on the, sacrifice, uh, on the altar and got them to pour 12 barrels over it and then prayed down the fire of God, and the fire came and burned up the, the, the wood, the wet wood and the sacrifice. And, I mean, this guy was an amazing, amazing man of God, and yet he ends up literally hiding out hiding under a tree out in the desert in basically a massive pity party, and he dropped out of the race. I, 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 for me, the, the epitome of it all, the, 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 the chapter, the verse, the reality that has, has been most encouraging to me in that whole arena of my life is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In fact, if, you, if you're going to follow up and read any passage, that's the one I'd like you to read. It's, it's Paul talking about what he was experiencing, the obstacles and the problems that were going on in Paul's life. And uh, in chapter 1, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 8, he's talking about these problems, and he says this, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardship that we suffered in the province of Asia. Here's how he described what was going on in his life. He said, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life itself. And, and I, I've always personally had the conviction that it wasn't the, as though Paul was saying, I despaired of life because I was afraid someone was going to kill me. I think he was despairing of life because he was so low and under so much pressure that he was actually contemplating ending his life. Now, I can't prove that, But to me, it's such a powerful picture of of being overwhelmed by the circumstances that you're facing and getting so pressed down and so frozen in the midst of it that you you didn't know if you could continue on. You couldn't face life. It happens. David Wilkerson, the great preacher in New York City, Times Square Church, he's the guy that as a young preacher went into New York and, and, uh, and, and witnessed to the gangs and... Uh, the cross and the switchblade is his amazing story. And I read one time of David Wilkerson preaching at a, at a great crusade. There were thousands of people, and they were, he was sitting in the chairs here as they did. The, the music was happening, and he's sitting here ready to preach. And inside of him, he's, he's, he's just hearing this, 
these, this voice saying, what in the world are you doing here? You are a hypocrite and you, you have not got what it takes to stand up and preach to these people and you have nothing to say to these people and you just, you, you just need to get out of here. You can't preach to this crowd tonight. And, and he says, in, as he tells that story, he, he got up and he said a couple of sentences and he deferred to one of his associates to come preach to him and he walked out of that event and went into a time of deep, deep despair and depression. Men and women of God that had amazing, amazing stories to tell of God working through them and yet they faced these situations. And I tell you these stories today to, to just remind you that no one is immune to this. That we all can be at that place where we feel like we're, we're drowning. In fact, that's a good word because the Bible d- describes the way the enemy works in our life. It says that he can come in like a flood. It's like, and we know about them, don't we here? Like, I went to bed and I didn't see the water was any, there was no danger. And all of a sudden, like, we're surrounded. It, it, it just kind of comes like a flood. And, and, and scholars, some scholars argue Paul was facing physical adversity and problems, and maybe he was. But I, for one, think he was struggling emotionally, and, and, and that was the challenge that he was having. And I have no simple answer for you today. If you're, if you're kind of relating to the, the picture I'm painting of what, of what men and women of God sometimes face in the desert experiences of their life, I, I, I have no... Uh, quick fixes for you, but I do, after facing some tough times myself, I do have two or three words of advice that I want to give you today, and they're very simple, but I hope that maybe they can, they can help you a little bit this morning, and the first is this. If you're, if you're in that experience in your life, number one is don't be freaked out by thinking that this experience is unique to you. Don't, don't be wasting any time or energy in this desert experience you're in of thinking that you're the only person that experiences this, that this is, this is unique to you. You're in good company. In fact, Peter, the apostle Peter said it this way. He said, friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. You could translate that and say, when you feel like your back is against the wall spiritually and you've run out of energy and and strength and faith and belief, there's nothing really wrong with you that God is is still at work and he's still there and he's got a plan and he's going to help you. Don't be freaked out by thinking that what you're feeling is unique to you. And number two, in the midst of your discouragement and disillusionment, stay the course. You could rephrase that this way. In the midst of your disillusionment and discouragement, don't do something stupid. Just, just, just be there and just, just wait on God. Ephesians says it this way, put on, you can say it, can't you? Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you can stand your ground and after you have done all, stand, stand. right? There's a point. There's a point you get to in those days where you, th- there's nothing more required of you than to stay the course, to stand your ground. That's the image of the unmovable tree with the roots going deeper down. The, the, the drier it gets, the deeper the roots have got to go to find the resources. Stay the course. Number three, resist the temptation to drop out of your spiritual routine and your Christian relationships. I'm going to say that one again. In the midst of disillusionment and discouragement, resist the temptation to drop out of your spiritual routine and your Christian relationships. Boy, is that tempting to do. It's, it's so, I mean, it is such a pull. You're in the midst, you're fighting those problems. Maybe it's failure or you're being beat up by circumstances or by people or you've been marginalized or abused or left out or passed over. I don't know what it might be, you know, but you, you're in a bad spot and you just, you, you come into a place like this and they start singing and you think like, get me out of here, right? This is, I, I, I can't do this, right? It just feels like oil and water. 
and, and you're hanging you're around with the people that are your friends, your, 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 your church family, and everybody's seeming like, this is great, and I'm on top of things, and how are you? Oh, I'm great, and all that's going on. And it's tough, boy, when you, when you aren't great, and you're, you're walking through deep water. It's tough to, to be there. But the point is, that's the very place you ought to be. Those are the very people you need. In fact, one of the only glimpses we get into the reason God allows those awful times in our life is that at some point, you're going to be in a place where God is going to allow you to minister to someone else out of the trial that you went through in the first place, you know? I mean, that's one of the only explanations we get of of pain and sorrow and trouble, that that God's going going to flow through you and pour into somebody else. And when you're in the midst of that, it's so easy to want to back out of those and withdraw socially. And and, and you don't want to be around people who you think don't understand what you're feeling or going through. And, and And you quit, you know, you quit going to Bible study and you quit participating and being around. And it's such an easy thing to do. And I, I urge you resist that temptation. And the last thing, the fourth thing is this, don't ignore the life raft. Now, what do you mean, life raft? What I mean is that in the midst of the desert experiences of your life, God's going to throw you a lifeline. There's going to be something come along. There's going to be some things happen that if you've got your spiritual antenna up and you're, you're expecting and you're watching and you're, you're seeking and looking to God that you might feel like it's been 400 years since you heard from him, but there's going to come something that it'll be a song, it'll be a prayer, it'll be a word, it'll be a hug, it'll be a, it'll be a, 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 a landscape, it'll be something that, that God very clearly makes himself, in fact, it might be one of the most amazing spiritual experiences of your life to know that when you needed him the most, he actually stepped in and revealed himself to you and, and threw you a lifeline. Don't ignore the life raft. It's that little illustration, you know, the guy that was facing the flood and he's up on the roof of his house and a guy comes by with a big truck that's so high that, you know, the, the water isn't up over the wheels and says, hey, buddy, come on, I can, I can get you out of here. And the guy says, no, no, God's going to help me. And the guy drives off with the truck and the water gets higher and the next guy comes along with a boat says, hey, buddy, I'm here to rescue you. No, no, thank God will help me. You know, I'm okay. And the guy with the boat leaves, and then there's just a little bit of the roof showing above the water, and the helicopter comes over and drops a basket. You know, we're here to rescue you. No, God's going to help me, you know. Finally, he drowns. He gets to heaven and says, God, where were you when I needed you? God said, well, I sent you the the truck, and I sent you the, the boat, and I sent you the helicopter, right? Don't ignore the places where God, where where God's reaching out. It could be even something about this message this morning. It could be something that's going to happen later this week. But, but you can count on it. God will be faithful to you to step into your life. David reflected on that. David, I mean, one of the reasons you ought to read the life of David is to understand what it means to, to walk through tough times. And in Psalm 18, this is David on the other side of the desert. He's coming out the other side of his disillusionment. His, this is, these are his words. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He's my shield and the horn of my salvation. He's my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I've been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. And in my distress, I cried to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into life. I mean, it's like looking in the rearview mirror coming out of the desert and realizing God, he, he saw you. He saw me. He, he, he was there. It's the footprints poem, right? The two tracks through life. You walking, God walking beside you. And then the person says, Lord, I look back, I see only one set of footprints through my difficult time. Where were you, God, when I needed you most? And I said, the set of footprints, my child, they were my footprints because I was carrying you. You know the poem. 
I mean, that's, that's what's happening when you're walking through this experience in your life. And maybe this message today has done nothing more than to clarify a little bit some of your feelings. Maybe it's allowed you to look behind you and, and realize that you're at a point where you need the Spirit of God to breathe some new wind into your sails and some new life into your spirit. You're, you've been waiting, and you, you need to be ready to, 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 to receive and, and to, to see what he's doing. You don't want to live in disillusionment. You want to live with vision. You want to be able to look forward and, and be filled with trust at what God's going to do and, and have a sense of confidence about tomorrow in your life. My life verse is 2 Corinthians 4, 16. And it says this, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them, I, them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Jesus said to John the Baptist, John, don't lose hope. You may not see it right now, but what's going on all around you? God's accomplishing his purposes and his plan. He's at work. He hasn't, he hasn't checked out. He hasn't abandoned you. There's a reason. There's a purpose. I'm going to bring you through this, and God's going to do it for you. I, I heard my good friend Steve Elliott tell this story, and Steve and I have been friends all of our life pretty well. I'd never heard this story, but recently uh, he was preaching, and he told about his little girl getting uh, sick or having some kind of physical problem, and he, he took her to the doctor. She was just a little girl, and she had to have this procedure that was frightening to her and painful to her and he said I I had my little girl in my arms and he said I passed her over to the doctor or the technician and she just went berserk she was screaming and crying and daddy daddy and he's trying to calm her down and say it's okay dear daddy's right here you know and the the doctor's trying to get ready to do what he needs to do and the girl is just beside herself and then it gets worse she she starts to say daddy daddy don't let him hurt me, you know, daddy, daddy. She says, I'd be good, daddy, I'd be good, you know. And, and, and she just couldn't, for the life of her, understand why Steve, who's just a few feet away, couldn't just step in and, and rescue her from that situation. And it's such a powerful illustration of the fact that sometimes when we're up against it the worst, and we might even be terrified, we might think, God, what are you doing, Lord? Don't, don't, make the mistake of thinking that because you feel like he's not coming through for you when you need him the worst that he's not there he's there and he knows and he he cares and for some reason that we can't see with our physical eyes some in the grand eternal perspective of what's going on in our life and in the life of others and in what God's doing in the world and in the kingdom and in in us for some grand purpose, God is allowing you to step through a circumstance and he has every intention of bringing you through that and, and bringing rescue and hope and healing. But in the process, he's wanting to build stuff into you that, that's going to bring great honor and glory to him and be good for you. The promise of God says that all things, right? And so I hope you receive that word today. And I want to pray for you specifically and as I pray, just as we close and the team's going to come to sing, how many of you here this morning would say, you know, as I think about this, uh, this is me. I mean, desert, yep. I, I'm there and I need, I need to, to, to experience God's touch and God's help in my life. I want, to be a, I want you to pray for me. I can hardly see you this morning, but would you just... Would you just Put up a hand wave and say, hey, I'm, that, I, I'm, that's me. I'm in on that. I need, I need God to, to help me and touch me. Lord, we, we, we just uh, thank you for your amazing ability. Even in the darkest places of our life, Lord, um, you, you are there. And I thank you for every shred of faith that we have, Lord. Those roots of faith and belief and trust in you that even can enable us to persevere through the dark nights of the soul. 
And Lord, I don't understand that journey. And I, I can't explain the, the pain and the sense of aloneness that sometimes accompanies the walk of faith. But Lord, I, I believe with all my heart that you love us and you have a reason and you are faithful and you are good and you have every intention of bringing to completion what you started in us, Lord, it's your promise. And for these people, Lord, who have requested this prayer today, Lord, I pray for every one of them. I'm so thankful that while I don't know what they're facing, Lord, you, you see them and you know them. And I pray for a deposit of of great faith and trust and stamina, Lord, as, uh, as Pastor Brent was referring to Ken and Deborah today, and to see, Lord, the, the stamina that has been required of them through this trial that they're going, Lord. Oh, God, I pray that you just would pour out upon each and every one of us exactly what we need from you today. We just open our hands to receive the help that we desperately need, Lord, and would would great deeper levels of faith and trust be poured into the life of someone here today, Lord. And then I thank you in advance for your ability to send a life raft and to show up and come to the rescue and step in and turn around circumstances and restore hearts and revive Lord, spirits, and I pray that for people in this place today. Thank you for all you're doing in our midst and the awesome privilege we have of being a part of your body. Thank you for each other today. May we be an encouragement and a support and a blessing to each other as we, as we live this week and as we serve you. We pray that you'd receive the honor and the glory from our lives, desert or not desert, good times or bad times, Lord. You're worthy of our praise, and we love you and we trust you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.